So welcome to Beauty and the Surgeon. I'm Dr. Jason Martin. I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon. We have Amy with us today. A and cer- every day. When am I not here? <laughs> today she's specifically with us because she's a certified nutritional therapist. And we are talking about stuff that she knows about today. Amy is actually the expert that we're interviewing today in regards to supplementation, specifically around surgery. But I'm going to ask her questions about supplementation with life because I think these things all apply. Are you okay with that? Oh, absolutely. Amy, so this podcast is about empowerment, education, and transformation. How do supplements around surgery apply to those tenants? Well, education about what you're taking is key. And that means being educated yourself, but also making sure to inform your physician about what you're taking, because there may be interactions with supplements, even if they're over the counter. I'm not talking about prescriptions. I'm talking about supplements that may interfere with your surgery. So it's important that you are educated about what you're taking and why, um, that you're able to tell your surgeon about that. And then transformative, I mean, we're doing surgery on you. This is specifically about supplementation around surgery. You want your results to be as best they possibly can be, and some targeted supplementation may really enhance your recovery. Okay. Yeah. And so for sure, anything that helps that transformation, I mean, at the very least helps you heal well and Mm -hmm. not have problems, uh, is most important. Yeah. And understanding what you're taking is definitely going to be empowering. There are a lot of people who come in to see us who, I mean, we had one patient bring in literally a basket full of supplements. She didn't know what half of them were for. And I'm like, oh, great, you're taking this for this and this for this. She's like, oh, I didn't know that. I'm like, I'm just taking these? <laughs> like, so I think that, yeah, be empowered. Like, know what you're taking and why. And right. that's, yeah. Okay, that's good. Uh, you may not think that supplementation around surgery is important. It actually really is. And Amy's the one who showed me that uh, in our practice. Uh, we do some things now that have absolutely made our results better. So if you're considering surgery or in, if you just like this podcast and you want to know about supplementation, this is actually a really good episode for you to listen to because Amy's going to break it down. All right, so let's get started. So definitely if you are listening and you'd like to see any like slides that go along with this, you can look at our um, YouTube channel, Jason Martin MD, and they'll be we'll have some of these slides up as well. But always reach out to me too, questions, comments. I'm happy to answer questions. So if you've got questions, send them to me in the comments. Send us a direct message on Instagram. I'll answer them. Yeah, everything. Yeah. So not Twitter though, because you don't like Twitter. I don't. I don't tweet. So <laughs> hit hit me up in, in <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> All right. So benefits of supplementation, specifically around surgery or injury. Let's just call it that too, because if you know someone who's going to have surgery for any reason, let's just stop for a second. We've talked about this before. Surgery is controlled injury. It is right. So we're not reinventing the wheel here. People are like, I don't understand why you would take a supplement. And it's like the same reason you take a supplement when you're injured. Correct. Right. Or when you're recovering from an ACL surgery. So even if you're not having plastic surgery, if you're having any surgery, you know, these things might apply to you. Always clear any supplements with your physician first, even if it's us. Even if it's one of these things I tell you to take, make sure you tell me you're taking it. <laughs> so the benefits of supplementation are that it can speed healing, reduce bruising and swelling. Those are things specifically like Arnica, which is homeopathic, and bromelain. Protein is great for injury recovery and also healing, and then just reduced inflammation, things like herbal supplements and turmeric. And what, yeah, what would you call that? Turmeric. You wouldn't call it turmeric? I call it turmeric. This is, this is the potato potato conversation you and I have all the time. So in Kentucky, they call it turmeric. Turmeric. I call it turmeric. <laughs> so a few that I'd like to hit on, because I want to say this too, I am not a pill for an ill kind of person. So I don't believe that everyone should be supplementing in all circumstances, but these are three key nutrients. So this is start from the beginning. Uh, actually, this is go back one step. Are supplements pills? Not always. And that's why you see on my previous slide, um, protein. I'm going to talk specifically about foods. Uh, so when we talk about supplements, we're talking about additional things that you can take orally, but maybe even apply as creams. It could be topical. Topical uh, that will help you along with any kind of surgery or injury, correct? Correct. Okay. These are supplements, I just mean things that you are taking in addition to the it's food supplemental, you're okay? Yeah, supplementing your Because I think that most people, including me, sometimes think supplements would be a pill. I mean, we're so, we're so like taught that you take a pill, but... Uh, the funny part is a lot of the compounds in a pill come in foods. Well, I mean, if you're taking something that's found in nature, they they primarily do. No, I'm talking about the supplements that people buy over the counter tend to have natural compounds in there that you could get also in oh, some Oh, no, that's sort of, what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Like, there shouldn't really be any supplement that you're buying, let's hope, that doesn't have a natural component, meaning it comes from nature. Okay. Right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, minerals, vitamins, these are all things that are found in nature. Even some heavy or some metal, metal substances that people might take, like molybdenum. Um, those are all things that are found in nature. By the way, we know molybdenum, molybdenum 
because it's mined near Leadville. Yep. And Climax it, mine. And it's used to make um, iron ore stronger. Yep, makes steel harder. Yep, so it was really used a lot in, we're getting way off topic here, um, during war times. <laughs> yeah, like World War II. And then it actually crashed. Like, I grew up in Summit County, which butts up against this mine. Yeah. So I knew a lot about it as a kid. But you can take molybdenum orally? You shouldn't need to. Molybdenum actually can become deficient. Ironically enough, in women who who have a lot of who Botox, live in, who live in Leadville, actually they're definitely yeah. not deficient. But um, minerals are usually a game of cofactors, as I say. So if you're getting, yeah, you know, they kind of have to be in the right balance. So you can become deficient in certain minerals. Absolutely, and molybdenum is one that's extremely rare to become deficient in because you need such tiny amounts of it to be healthy um, that it would be extremely rare for someone to need to supplement. What extremely in God's rare. name does molybdenum do in the, in your human body? It's a mineral that helps with all types of mineral type contractions. So it's going to help with muscle contraction, um, how flu or how flexible some of your arteries are. Yeah, okay. Muscle firing. Yeah. It's crazy. We've gotten way off topic here. We've gotten into minerals. Sorry. <laughs> so like I said, I don't think that most people uh, need to supplement on a daily basis, healthy people. But these are three things specifically around the time of surgery that are very helpful that most people will probably benefit from by supplementing because they are harder to get in the optimal amounts from food. Let's first talk about vitamin K, which is a fat-soluble vitamin, vitamin meaning it dissolves in fat, not in so water. So we know that the mnemonic for fat-soluble vitamins are ADEK, A-D-E-K. Yep. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about vitamin D also. But vitamin K, there's K1 and there's K2. K1 is going to come primarily from plant-based. Uh, K2 is going to be a fermented form of K1 that actually ferments into K2 in your gut. But you can get it from animal sources and also from fermented foods. So some super high um, concentrations of vitamin K in the diet are going to be things like dark leafy greens. Uh, collard greens specifically are really high in vitamin K. Natto is a fermented soybean. But what does vitamin K do? Well, I know for a fact, being a physician, because that makes me real smart. Does right? make you really smart. All right, so that people on Coumadin can't take, can't eat leafy greens because it can affect with clotting. It can. So Coumadin is a blood thinner. So the last thing you want to do is take something that might alter blood clotting, which is what vitamin K does. It it helps produce a necessary clotting factor. It's also really key in bone development, but it's good to have in the right percentage, especially prior to surgery, because it's gonna help you clot normally, it's gonna help you from bleeding. Less bruising. Less bruising, less bleeding after surgery, uh, keeps your blood vessels healthy. It also has been shown to be really helpful for cognition, um, bone function, so a lot of people take it for memory-related issues. The recommended dosage that I would have people take of MK7 specifically, which is a specific type of vitamin K, MK7 is 100 micrograms per day, and it needs to be taken in the morning on an empty stomach. And where do you get MK7? You can get it over the counter at any supplement stores you okay. carry. But it's not all vitamin K is created equal, and that's why I think that distinction is important because if you're taking tons of K1, but your body can't convert it into vitamin K2, which is what's the storable form of vitamin K, you're not gonna be getting the benefit. Yeah, but you do, you do the fermented stuff and then you get the benefits of the fermented stuff with your gut. You do, yeah. So, and then you get the vitamin K out of that too. It's like a win-win. It is, and vitamin K can be stored, so you're gonna store it in your liver and also in fatty tissue because it's a fat-soluble vitamin. So it's something that you don't wanna take a lot of really quickly. It's better just to start with a small dose, like that 100 micrograms per day, and just stay consistent with okay. it. Okay, so first thing is vitamin K. We got that. Yep. What's the next one? Vitamin D is the next one. It's actually, as you know, not a vitamin. It's really a hormone. And the reason that it's a hormone is because we can actually produce it ourselves. Right. Our, our bodies can synthesize it from sunscreen, or from sun, <laughs> from sunscreen. Sunscreen is actually one of the reasons <laughs> why people don't have enough vitamin D. So it's something we can make, but it's also something that is becoming something that now is being studied more around the world even. there's They're saying that somewhere upwards of 20 to percent of people may be deficient in vitamin D. Yeah, so there's a study that came out, and, I don't, and of course I don't have all the components of it, but they were talking about vitamin D. There's been some S, um, correlation with low vitamin D in cancer. Yep. And they're showing Moods. that they're, they're, they don't have a 100% correlation that if you increase your vitamin D, that you're not gonna get cancer. But there's definitely certain cancers that it is it does, uh, if your vitamin D levels are normal, apparently the incidence of cancer will go down. Yeah, colon cancer is one of them. Yeah, so that's, and I think vitamin D is gonna be one of those main factors moving forward that we're gonna watch more closely. Mm -hmm. So how does vitamin D affect healing? So vitamin D is important for healing because it 
has a lot to do with the way our immune system functions and okay. how wounds heal. Right. So we know that healing is primarily guided by what? The immune system, mm -hmm. right? So if you have a poor immune system, if you were immunodeficient, you can't heal well. Um, and so vitamin D is important to support that system. Where do we get vitamin D from besides where we you know, get it from the sun exposure? So sun exposure is great. And the problem is that most people now are so concerned with skin cancer that we're covering ourselves up with sunscreen all the time, which is great, but that's blocking our skin's ability to synthesize that vitamin D from the sun. So, so we should do like um, sunscreen like six days a week and then one day just one get just, burnt? No, no. And actually it's, it, there is, if someone you know does not have issues with sun exposure, getting a little bit every day is definitely beneficial. They okay. call it the sun, like the sunshine vitamin, for a reason because it makes us happy, it boosts our mood. Like vitamin D does all those things. Well, on our podcast where we talked about things we're into, I talked about hiking, and you said the Japanese talk about forest bathing. Yes. And I'm sure part of the forest bathing is is sunbathing. Being outside. And you get a yeah. little vitamin D action going makes on. Makes you happy, boosts your mood. So sun is obviously a great place to get it. One thing to know though is that vitamin D you kind of reach an optimal level with your stores and that's something I actually didn't. They said that too because people try to like highly optimize vitamin D and it doesn't help you any in some ways could be problematic. It can and the they say the upper limit for vitamin D intake is somewhere around um, 4,000 IU a day but they've done studies where they've given people high dosages for long periods of time up to 10,000 IU a day and have seen no negative side effect and that's something I did not bring up um, with vitamin K. There actually is no known upper limit because it's something that can't really be tested in tissue of living people, they can test it post-mortem. So they've kind of come to the recommendation for dosing on vitamin K based on that. Whereas vitamin D, they can actually test that. They can do a serum blood test and test your vitamin D levels. Good food sources, cod liver oil, which is something I would tell you to stop taking before surgery because it can also thin your blood. So if you are pre-surgery taking the cod liver oil, I'm gonna tell you to stop ironically, but. I mean. <laughs> I love my cod liver oil. <laughs> and you know, it's, but that used to be something that was given to children like every day. I mean, where do you buy that? <laughs> at the health food store, a spoonful of cod liver oil. Oh yeah. my God. Boost immunity. Like I mean, the old days, I mean, I'm sure they're gonna say that about us in 60 years, but some of the stuff that was going on. It was different. Uh, but your fattier fish is like herring, swordfish, cold water fishes. Miyatake mushrooms are actually extremely high in vitamin D when they're raw. Um, some of these things, you know, and I'll say that is like cooked or raw, does make a difference for some vitamins because they can break down at heat. So miyatake mushrooms are very high in their raw form cooked, not as much. My recommendation for supplementation, actually, you know this because I just asked you to start supplementing in the winter. For those of us who live, you know, below a certain latitude, we definitely should be supplementing in the winter. And just at 2,000 IU a day. Once a day, it should definitely be an oral. And those oral. are drops that you gave me. Absolutely should be an oral suspension. Yeah, so it's, oral suspension. So the vitamin K we can get definitely through diet, but you told us to get the MK7. The vitamin D, do you have a specific recommendation on that? A there brand? is. Biotics is the brand that we carry, and that yeah. is the one I prefer. It's in a liquid. You drop it in your mouth. And the reason for that is, like I said before, vitamins, minerals are all usually a game of cofactors, right? So they, they help each other out. Vitamin D and calcium are very closely linked. So when you put vitamin D in your mouth and you can even kind of rub it all over your teeth, it actually increases your absorption of it because it's connecting with those, you know, calcium molecules and getting it into your system faster and more efficiently. So it's actually the best way to take it. Vitamin D taken orally, a lot of it's probably going to bypass your digestive system and it's not the right type of vitamin D to be usable. And so do most people get vitamin D shots? N no, I, I would do it orally. I yeah. mean, there are people who do shots of vitamin yeah. D, but there again, you're reaching that limit of like perhaps getting a bit too much. Yeah. Okay. So I'd rather somebody be supplementing at a, you know, a moderate level, right? This is under what the, way under what the um, recommendations are. Max, yeah. you know, max level is. Yeah. Other areas you could get this from. No, let's just leave it at that. Okay. Was, I'm, I'm reaching ahead of myself. Okay, that's okay. We'll leave it at that. So no, that's okay. <laughs> so, so so you you got the vitamin K, you got the vitamin D, right? And so anyone doing surgery. Um, it might be good to supplement these things. I mean, you'd have to obviously talk with your surgeon first and, your, and, the, and the doctor you work with. But um, you also talked about another vitamin, Yep. So which is my faves. Vitamin C is your favorite? Yeah. Well, the singer or the vitamin? No, because uh, if I have C. <laughs> so because it's related to collagen. Collagen is related to scars. Mm -hmm. The type of collagen that goes in a scar will make a scar look better or worse. My whole career is based on vitamin C. It's true. It really is because it is a necessary cofactor in the production of collagen, specifically for repairing tissues, things like tendons, ligaments, skin. Like we need collagen. It We've also- We've talked about it on a previous podcast, scurvy. What, which podcast did we talk about scurvy? Not scurvy? Yeah, we, it was a long time ago. Which one was it, Nils? Oh, Do you know? Nils. 
Do you remember us talking about scurvy? Yeah. We did, really? yeah. Or, we talked about something related to surgery, that people want to diet after surgery, and we talked about when you limit yourself of nutrition, yeah. um, like the example of scurvy. Efficiency, yeah. rickets, rickets, very, very. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I don't remember. It was, actually, I think it was the podcast about how to have a good surgery, like how to optimizing have optimizing outcomes. Optimizing maybe? outcomes, optimizing yeah. outcomes yeah. yeah. Listen to that podcast. It's actually really good. It kind of mentioned some of these things in here, but not in detail. Yeah. Okay. So vitamin C. So vitamin C is also an antioxidant. Fights free radicals. So after you know when you're recovering from something, there's going to be a lot of you know leftover stuff perhaps from your either your injury that led up to your surgery or your surgery itself. You know, it's kind of disrupted things. Antioxidants are going to help get everything back to like normal fight off anything weird, boost your immune system, as most people know. But the way it does that is kind of through this free radical mm -hmm. activity. So what is like a free radical? I mean, like, you know, you think about that, it, it's basically like super oxide, it's, it's basically little teeny compounds that have a certain charge to them. Correct, yeah, like, almost like a zombie cell, right? Yeah. That kind of starts going haywire. Yeah. And it, it could have been a normal cell that got damaged right. or was injured somehow that starts acting all crazy. Yeah, and I think that actual free radical compounds can be as little as a molecule, right? And it's That's like Sometimes it is just one tiny yeah, molecule. Yeah, and yeah. so those get in and just start causing problems uh, and ultimately can affect the DNA and everything else right. involved with your normal body functioning. And that's why it's important to kind of fix those. And definitely they're more common um, with injury. Yes, and vitamin C is kind of a volatile compound in itself, not volatile, but it's, it breaks down really easily. So that's even why you see orange juice sold in cardboard most of the time. And if you ever do buy orange juice, you wanna buy it in cardboard because it, it blocks the exposure to light. Same thing if a vitamin C that you're gonna put on your face. You never wanna buy a vitamin C that you're gonna put on your skin in a clear container because it's, it's gonna be degraded because it breaks down really quickly. So yeah. the same thing, it breaks down really quickly in our bodies, which is why vitamin C is not something that your body stores for long amounts of time. So to continue proper collagen production, you kind of need to keep up your intake. So unlike uh, vitamin K, which is stored in the fat, vitamin D, which is stored in the liver, yes? Yep. Okay, vitamin C is not really stored anywhere. It really isn't, like it, it breaks down really fast. So it's kind of constantly needed and your body's constantly drawing it, like drawing on it. Which but is why that's the one thing that'll get you when you're a sailor, right? Because right. your body can make the vitamin D, they're probably eating fish, which they're has- They're eating all that herring. Herring, yes. right, and, and, and cod oil. All that cod liver oil, yes. Uh, when they were coming over on the Mayflower, but they weren't having things that had vitamin C in it and your body can't make it and you can't store it. So, right. I mean, you only got a couple of weeks maybe at the most. Yeah, and it's devastating. Yeah. We talked about the effects of scurvy, really okay. devastating. So, so all right. Um, most people get adequate intake from food. However, especially if you're not eating an organic diet, you're not getting as much vitamin C as you may think. So commercially produced produce, fruits and vegetables are gonna be relatively low in vitamin C versus their organic counterpart. So I would definitely recommend Getting your fruits and veggies. You say that stuff all the time, but you say it as fact. I mean, is that really the case? Yeah, there are actual studies? studies on that. Yes, there are actual studies on that. That is a fact. Is that kind of getting into the GMO situation or no? Not necessarily the GMOs. It's it's really any conventionally produced strains of oranges have been kind of hybrid so much for different Yeah, for their endurance. Yeah, yeah. And whatever. juiciness and other yeah. things that they've kind of hybrid that out of them. So I get if you were Needing to buy commercially produ produced food for whatever reason, I would look for heritage varieties of oranges um, or fruits or veggies rather than uh, conventional style, I guess. That's so wild. You know, yeah. you, you go to the grocery store and you pick things out. I mean, it, okay, so there's a financial restriction, yes. right? For some people. I'm but, sensitive to that, absolutely. No, I understand. Yeah. So let's just say there wasn't a financial restriction. You go to the grocery store, like, I'll just grab some fruit, but not all fruit is equal, which is so disturbing and it's so complicated. Yeah, and not all food is equal. And that's, you know, that's why, this is why it's empowering to get this knowledge. And that's why it's transformative. That's right. Okay. So good food sources of vitamin K are gonna be your bright, bright foods, like vibrant foods, like leafy greens, red peppers, orange peppers, kiwi, citrus fruit. These are best eaten raw or lightly steamed specifically for your vitamin C context. Remember, vitamin C breaks down really easily. It also breaks down easily in food. When you cook it, that heat kind of destroys it. And also exposure to light. So if you are drinking orange juice, make sure you're getting it in a cardboard so container. So the vitamin K foods thing. you can cook. The vitamin D foods, uh, it doesn't matter as much, but the vitamin C, definitely you want to eat raw. Raw or very lightly steamed Got if it. it's veggies. Um, Something to keep in mind with upper limits of vitamin C, recommended daily intake is relatively low to keep you from getting scurvy, right? It's like 250 milligrams a day or even less. It's like 
90 milligrams a day to keep you from getting scurvy, to becoming completely deficient. However, to optimize your vitamin C levels, because remember it does break down really easily. If you're using a lot of it to recover, you're gonna deplete it more rapidly. So I would recommend supplementing in the 500 to 1000 milligrams a day. However, some people's stomachs are very sensitive to vitamin C and it can cause stomach distress, diarrhea. Like, so if you're having that, like you, you may need to slowly increase it, break it up into multiple doses throughout the day rather than taking it all at once. Uh, but upper limit is very high. So you're gonna get stomach issues before you're maxing yourself out on the, your body's ability to process all that vitamin C. So vitamin C you would no, just primarily get through food. So there's not any supplements that are light stable or whatever that you would recommend. Is that correct? No, I mean, right around surgery, I would. Like if you know you're having surgery, I think taking 500 to 1000 milligrams a day of additional supplementational okay. vitamin C is good, especially because around the time of surgery, you, know, you may not feel up to you know eating a ton of raw fruits and veggies. Got it. You know, so it, it, I would recommend something with that specifically around surgery for a normal diet. I would hope that you could get your vitamin C, but perhaps not. And that's just, that's more of a deeper conversation you need to have with your nutritional therapist or your doctor, naturopath, whoever is kind of monitoring your health. Okay. So these are my top three. So these are the three that, like I said, are going to be more challenging to get through diet, definitely are going to be beneficial to have optimized prior to surgery and also during your recovery period because of the amazing things that they do. Vitamin KDC. Yeah, KDC. you know me. Okay. All right. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> so moving on to the supplements that are not necessarily food related, even though bromelain is sort of, um, Arnica. And a lot of people know about Arnica, right? Yeah, but so the, I'm so happy you have this slide. So where does Arnica come from? I've never asked you this question. Arnica comes from a little flower that looks kind of like a daisy. It's only on top of the Himalayas. Uh, no, it's everywhere. But There's it's some a, Sherpa going up, right, picking it. Picking for, it. <laughs> yes, like at the top of top of a very high mountain. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it comes from a flower, and uh, mm -hmm. um, is it is Arnica was Arnica originally more like a uh, East Asian kind of like a more of an Asian? No, European. More European. Mm -hmm. Okay. European. Interesting. Yeah. Top and it was t primarily used topically um, initially, a topical kind of pack or tincture um, applied to this these areas of injury. It's really beneficial for inflammation, and it also acts kind of like an antioxidant, and that's what they've studied, and they have done lab studies on these compounds to kind of figure out what it, why it works, right? Like, why do homeopathic things work? This comes from a flower. Like, what is this possibly doing? So homeopathic, what does that mean? It just means it's from, like... Natural stuff. It's a, a, typically from a flower. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, it's a, it's not an herb. It's it's going to be something that's a different substance that's kind of extracted from nature in some Got way. It. Okay. Yeah. So Arnica, they think, in the body, acts like a lactone, which is, there again, a, a tiny little ester molecule that you know, is in the link of other chains of molecules that helps with inflammation and pain. So they have studied it to try and figure out why, but they've also done double blind studies with Arnica and other anti-inflammatories and found it to be as effective for decreasing inflammation and also for decreasing pain. So it's very cool. And it's the one we recommend is called Tea Relief. We carry Tea Relief Pro, which is one you can get only from physicians, but there's an over-the-counter version of Tea Relief that is also very effective. Yeah. I tell you, Tea Relief has made a huge difference in our patient's recovery. Yeah. I mean, literally when we started using that, the patients seemed like they had less pain and swelling. Well, we were using far less prescription pain medication. Yep. You know, we have patients now who will do, you know, relatively minor surgeries and not take their pain medication at all. Right. So that is T relief, T dash relief. And we actually, you actually started before surgery, right? You kind of load yep. them up with it a little bit. Yeah, and the reason for that, kind of like any of these natural substances, is that because they're not naturally occurring in the body, you kind of want to get yourself to like that optimal level so that when the event occurs, especially if you know it's coming, that your body's kind of prepared. Yeah. Like your soldiers are ready to fight. Yeah. Uh, the other one, and this does come from food, pineapple enzyme, which is called bromelain. It decreases inflammation, and they've actually used this topically for wound healing, for debridement. They'll actually apply bromelain topically to open wounds. So, I mean, literally, it's a, they put the pineapple they'll on put top? The powder, no, they'll put the bromelain powder um, on these open wounds to help debreed the wound, because it's an enzyme. So it's breaking down those inflammatory yeah, substances. Yeah, you, you know that, I mean, the pineapples themselves are enzymatic when you mm -hmm. eat them, so... That's interesting. Yeah. And I wonder it, if that's, the, is bromelain the compound in there that makes it feel kind of enzymatic in there or no? In combination yeah, so it's, it's with things acidic. like citric acid yeah, and acidic, other things yeah. too. But that bromelain is a great thing to supplement with because the amount of pineapple that you'd need to consume would be very difficult for your digestive system to probably handle, especially right after surgery. So I definitely, like pineapple's great to include after surgery, but I would still supplement with bromelain 
rather than just chugging gallons of pineapple juice because you're going to get some adverse GI effects if you do that. It is important when you're taking bromelain specifically to have an effect on inflammation. You want to take it on an empty stomach. Why? So you take it with food, it's going to help break down your food. It is an en- it is a dig- it's an enzyme, right? So it's going to break down protein. So if you're taking your bromelain with all your meals, it's not going to be any left to help with the inflammation yeah, in your body. Do the inflammation part. Yeah. Okay. So definitely take it on an empty stomach. The recommendation that I give patients is 2,000 GDU a day, three times a day, and not with food. So don't want to take that with food. <laughs> so those are my, those are my uh, non-food. Eggs. So your slide here for all the people listening, you can watch this on at Jason Martin or the Jason Martin ND YouTube channel. Uh, it says, "Let food." be thy medicine. Yes, because like I said at the beginning, I, th- I really feel like a properly prepared nutrient-dense diet should in most circumstances give you what you need, but there are times when supplementation becomes really beneficial. So, I mean, you, it's not complicated so far. You've said K, vitamin K, vitamin D, vitamin C, mm-hmm. um, arnica, bromelain. That's it so far. Yeah, so I mean, so th- you got five things there. She gave you the, the dosage amount. She told you how to take them. She told you where to get them. In most cases, she told you the type of supplement to buy. So, I mean, this is kind of a roadmap for supplementation with surgery. It is. Okay, good. Yeah, so one other big question I get asked a lot is, should I take a multivitamin? And I, years ago, would have said yes, mostly because, you know, you kind of think like, well, most people are deficient in a lot of things. Now, if your diet is not good, um, you are eating a standard American diet, you are eating a lot of fresh fruits and veggies, like taking a multivitamin may be appropriate for you. Um, however, they've done studies, long-term studies on very large population bases of people who take a multivitamin versus people who supplement with single single supplements, essentially, single targeted supplements, and your lifespan is no longer. So multivitamin is not, inc- not making your health better and it's not increasing your lifespan in any way. So I would much rather a patient address their nutritional deficiencies ahead of time. But if you are like, you have to have surgery, it's kind of coming up last minute, start taking a multivitamin, then work on your diet after. Yeah. So there's a great book. If anyone is interested in learning more about a lot of these individual vitamins, uh, the perfect health diet by Paul and Shu Xing Jamine, Jamine, uh, is a great book, the perfect health diet. It's talks a lot about nutrition overall, but then the whole second half of the book literally breaks down every single individual nutrient. Oh, they're married. Nutrient. They're married. I, I mean, I hope so. <laughs> so this Paul Jamine's last name and then Shuxing was obviously not Shuxing Jamine. I'm guessing she was Shuxing something else. Okay. Yeah. But it's a great book. So if you are interested in, you know, m- getting a little bit more in depth on this and specifically regarding vi- multivitamin and or single vitamin intake, it's a great book. The perfect Which you can diet. absolutely probably download that book or you could do what Amy does and you can check it out from the library. From the library. <laughs> and then buy it from the library because you've become obsessed with it. <laughs> So, so you just don't return it and they charge you for it? Well, there's that too. <laughs> I would never do that. That's do you think why. the librarian's like the weird ladies coming in though? Yeah. Right. Like right. there she is again. She got like 15. Ooh, oh, I like this slide too. This is good. Yeah. So this last slide, before we get to that, one more thing I kind of want to briefly talk about is prior to surgery, like I said at the beginning, is make sure you do inform your physician of anything you're taking. Even if it's something you heard me talk about on this podcast, it may not be appropriate for your specific surgery or and or you may need to alter how you're taking it. Uh, good Good reminder of that is I had a patient come to me for nutrition counseling. She was scheduled to have heart surgery, and she was taking something that I would tell her to stop taking before cosmetic surgery. I'm like, did you tell your heart surgeon you're taking this? And she's like, well, I may have mentioned it to his nurse. I'm like, you need to write this down that you are taking this and make sure they see this in writing. I mean, the unfortunate part, I mean, maybe not a heart surgeon, but infor- a lot of surgeons may not understand how these supplements work. Correct. And that's what people need to understand listening to this podcast because you need to take, you know, ownership of you, especially if you're going into surgery and make sure that something you're taking couldn't be contraindicated or a problem with surgery. Yes. So. And if in doubt, just take it out, like stop taking it. I mean, supplements by definition are things that are supplementing your diet, not providing it. So they should be things you can remove without extremely adverse effects for a short term. Other things you definitely want to avoid prior to surgery are things that are stimulants. So things like ginkgo, even high doses of echinacea, which around this time of year, cold season, people may be taking a lot of echinacea. I would have you take that out before surgery. Um, large dose of caffeine, and then some other herbal supplements, like I said, like ginkgo, obviously anything that's a diet pill. So what do we tell people that are big coffee drinkers? We tell them that they cut it, they cut it down, right? You can still have a cup of coffee, yes. you just can't have 
five a pot cups. of coffee. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's about reducing your intake. And caffeine, the effect of caffeine, the half life of caffeine is not super long. So as long as you're not like chugging caffeine right before surgery, you're probably going to be okay. But if you have an extremely high intake, and or you're like piggybacking your caffeine, like you're drinking coffee or taking a pre-workout supplement, you're maybe taking a thermogenic diet supplement, which a lot of our patients take, you know, that's too much. Like that amount of caffeine is definitely too much. You need to cut that back to give your body a chance to yeah, kind of recover. Yeah, all those diet supplements have caffeine in it. Yes, and that's yeah. something you definitely- or most of them, I mean. Oh, so. pretty much all of yeah. them. Uh, fish oils in, you know, pretty much any any surgeon is gonna- It's interesting, you. the fish oil part, um, they, they, the study just came out about fish oil too, and it said it didn't really make that much of a difference. I know, and I read that too. And I, I almost printed it out and brought it in just to put it on your desk and not say anything, just like drop the mic and walk away. Right, like poof, fish oil. Yeah. And uh, yes, I agree. And there are actually but you really, like fish oil. I do, and that's why I was just gonna say that. See, all from, you nutritional therapists, you guys do this. Like, uh, fish oil is cool. Like, we love fish oil, and then it's not. Then the data comes out. I, it's, I don't like fish oil. No, I love fish oil, and it's something that I recommend people integrate back into their diet very quickly after surgery because it's going to help a lot with prostaglandin formation, um, specifically correct prostaglandin formation, which helps with inflammation following surgery. So, my recommendation for people to avoid taking fish oil is more based on. Western medicine, and it's recommendation that fish oil can thin your blood unless you should stop taking it prior to surgery. Okay. But how profound that effect is, is of course gonna mat- like be based on your overall health. And your dosage. Correct. And remember, like the, pro- the problem the with all these supplements is none of this stuff is totally regulated, so you, people don't really fully understand dosaging. I mean, they maybe on the vitamins they do, but some of these other things get kind of weird. Well. A lot of them are manufactured in China, um, and so you're, you're not absolutely 100% confident they're manufactured correctly. Potency. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then, so, you know, I think that it's always best to uh, just kind of stick with the roadmap that Amy's laying out and stop your other supplements and you can start up afterwards and do what you want. You can be like the lady with the big basket of supplements. Right. And take uh, there them. were some good ones in there for her. But I mean, the dose truly does make the poison. Was it a basket like Red Robin Hood basket, like it had. It actually was. It was a big wicker basket. Oh my gosh! Yeah, like and it was the, all like, filled with pills. Oh, filled. And I mean, filled. No. There okay. had to be twenty supplements in there. Is this a patient? That this was is a ours? patient of ours. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah, yeah. That's we got to talk to Awesome her. patient. So, any other oils that you might be taking, if you're taking evening primrose oil, you know, other types of oils you may be taking for therapeutic purposes, make sure you clear this with your doctor and/or just stop taking them. So. Things that I definitely would have people avoid that are a food are gonna be your industrial seed oils, things like canola oil, you know, weird oils I'm gonna have somebody cut out altogether. They're not gonna help you with your inflammation. This is not gonna be good. Processed sugars and alcohol. Those are all things that if you want to have the best outcome from your surgery, you're gonna cut those things out yeah. prior to surgery. Okay. So things to include. And like, we talked about that many times before. So. Alcohol is not good around surgery no. time. It's inflammatory. Yeah, it's a burden on your liver. I'm just repeating exactly what Amy said. It's from that same podcast about recovery. Um, alcohol is a toxin. It stresses your liver. Your liver has to deal with surgery, specifically the anesthetics and all the stuff that's going through it and the medication. If you overload your liver with alcohol because you're in pain, and you think that's really smart to have a, a Percocet. Which people do, and then, and then chase it with some wine, some vodka, yeah. um, or wine. It's not good. So cut that out, or knock it down at least enough to where you're only taking a little bit, a little bit during the recovery phase. Well, never ever mix alcohol with prescription pain medication ever. Yeah. So what can we include? So I've told you all the things you need to cut out. So things to include are going to be our organic fruits and veggies, dark leafy greens, fatty fish, things like salmon. Cold water fishes are great. As Sounds we saw great. This is like All right, so what, you eat? what a wonderful diet. Eggs. Eggs are amazing. We didn't really talk about that in the vitamin D, but one of the great food sources of vitamin D are things like liver and eggs, which are things that a lot of people egg yolk specifically, not egg whites. Egg whites have no vitamin D. Egg yolks. What about all those bros out there doing the bro diets? <laughs> I mean, they're not getting a lot of vitamin D. And that's, you know, they're they're probably vitamin D deficient unless they're, but they're going to tanning booths. People so. don't realize that the egg yolks are just so nutritionally. Oh, yes, they're Powerhouse. Beneficial, yeah. Oh my goodness, they have all they have all your ADE and Ks in them. They're like yeah, amazing. The whole ADEC. Yeah, bone broth is great. I've talked about that on many podcasts. Yeah, you love bone broth. I do, uh, especially I for you, recovery. You bathe in bone broth, or you? I have you're some cooking at home bone broth. right now. I filled my crock pot with bones this morning. Every <laughs> single time, there's something going on physically. You always recommend bone broth. I do. Yeah. Well, and specifically for healing, because as I've talked about before, when you're cooking down those bones, you're kind of leaching the minerals out of them. You're getting all those good substances, the chondroitin out of the collagen that might be still attached to the bones and the kind of those gristly bits. Like, it's just amazing for recovery. So very, very good. Fiber is one that we didn't really talk a lot about, but if you're eating a diet that's high in these leafy greens, constipation is a common complaint after surgery. 
You don't want to overload your system with fiber, which is why doing an all raw diet after surgery I would not recommend. That might be too hard on your digestive system. Some lightly steamed veggies, some raw fruits. So you have a nice balance of some easier to digest you know, produce and then some you know, roughage essentially to kind of get your fiber up. Staying hydrated is all going to help you with that after surgery. Okay. Okay. So now we get on to the slide. The slide says, what about THC and CBD? Mm. So, so we're in Colorado. So I think I was reading like 20 states now, 25 states have legal marijuana maybe. Mm -hmm. And some of those are just for medical purposes. But this is becoming more and more of a topic. We kind of laugh about it in Colorado, but now it's becoming an American question. And I do think it's really important since a lot of people listen to this podcast specifically who are interested in plastic surgery. Um, they're probably in states where you could get CBD oil. So what is... Yeah, CBD oil is non-psychoactive. So you right. can get CBD, I think, in all 50 states. Right, and that's that, that's where my mind went to first because CBD oil tends to be where people go. It's not going to change your sensorium. It helps supposedly with pain and discomfort. Mm -hmm. People rub it on areas of joints that hurt, arthritis, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so for me, um, CBD oil is actually can be taken orally and it can also be applied topically. And it is something that is a great option for patients after surgery. It's non-psychoactive. It does not have that same effect as the THC on your neurons in the brain. It will not make you high. You won't come up you know, high on a drug test with this, but it, it definitely can. Those cannabinoids do affect our carcinoid system and can affect inflammation. This, and they are studying this, which is great. They can actually study CBD because it's not illegal. There are very few studies on the therapeutic use of THC because it is not legal. Mm -hmm. So there, if you're interested, there are some great studies on CBD use after surgery for recovery from injury, for healing, um, even for you know other things like anxiety and pain relief. Yeah. Do you, I mean, you probably don't know this, but do you know any brands that you would recommend? I mean, yes. And I'll, I'll post those actually, I'll probably just post those on Instagram because there are a couple that are very good that you can get in most states. Cured nutrition is a great one. Um, the one I um, specifically use is called select. Um, it's great. So there, there are a few that are very good and very highly regulated. Um, there's another great one. Um, Colorado actually is where select comes from. Select CBD is a Colorado company. Um, no, Cured. I'm sorry, Cured is Colorado Company Select I get from out of state. But you want to make sure that the person you're getting it from does routine testing and is actually testing to make sure that there is no THC in their product and that it's very, very pure. Yeah. So that it's organically produced. There again, I mean, this is a plant. So, like, you want it to be organically produced just like any other produce. I, think, I mean, I, you know, I think people have this image of this dude with a goatee, like, hey, man, make right. my CBD oil. Listen to Bob Marley. This is, this is big industry now. So it is. These are huge outfits that are making these. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's I mean, it's, it's growing rapidly, and I do think that it's going to have to be addressed. You know, um, medicine and the, with these kind of things tends to be behind the times, mm -hmm. especially with alternative treatments. And I'm the first to admit that because I get swayed with Western medicine and medications and that kind of stuff. So su supplementation is something that's foreign to us a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the fact that this is becoming a possibility, I think it's really interesting. Yeah, and I think you're, you're very correct in your kind of hesitance about supplements because people tend to think more is more. Right? More is more. I'm We're just America. More. Yeah. America. You know, I'm going to just, I'm going to take 10,000 IU of vitamin D every day. That can actually make your arteries harder. Like that yeah. could make recovery bad. You know, so if supplementation should be properly dosed. It should be taken for specific needs only. Like, and that's why I think taking multivitamin may not be the right choice for everybody because you may not need that. And if you're getting supplemental, like iron specifically, it, it may alter the way your body utilizes the natural iron that, that it's getting. So you don't want to do that. Right. You know, like you want to be getting most of your nutrition from food. And then these supplements should really just be like the, the final push to like get you over, get you through recovery. Yep. You know, get you over an illness. Like. Okay. So, so if we're going to do surgery, when do we start these and when do we stop these? I know it's person specific and you need to work with the people that would, you know, recommend these things, but in general. In general, I would have someone start vitamin D and K pretty far out from surgery, mostly because you want to do those slowly and give your body a chance to get up to the optimal dosage. So how so far out? Ideally about a month. I mean, if someone has that time, I would start those four weeks prior to surgery. Okay. Vitamin C, because it breaks down so quickly, you, I mean, you're going to benefit from taking it the day of surgery. Okay. And, you know, like right after surgery, you know, so those things are, they need to be more in your stomach. We time. talked about Arnica tea relief. We start at least a week beforehand. Um, or three days is the minimum with Arnica. Yeah. And there again, that's just to kind of get that level up. Bromelain, you're not going to benefit from taking ahead of time because it's so specific in what it's doing. Taking it before surgery is great, especially if you need it for help for digestion. But yep. 
specifically related to surgery, you're better taking that after. Okay. Um, same thing with like CBD oil. If you're taking it specifically to help with uh, inflammation and pain after surgery, start it after surgery. If you're super anxious and can't sleep beforehand, maybe take it before. <laughs> like, right. you know, it's that could be used for both. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the dietary recommendations, specifically bone broth, every meal, all the time. Um, when do you usually, so not, I mean, I would love for everyone to eat the way that Amy tells us to eat, but most people don't. So when would you have them start working on their diet before surgery? Best case scenario. Best case scenario, same thing in a month out, because that's giving your body a chance to naturally kind of adapt and adjust and make sure that if there's anything we want to change or you're having some adverse side effects from maybe adding in too much of something. Because when I say let food be thy medicine, food has a powerful effect on the body. I mean, even something with vitamin C, like some one person might be fine taking, you know, four or 5,000 milligrams of vitamin C at once and have no stomach upset. Another person might take 500 and be running to the bathroom. So to make the most optimal changes to your diet and also to make sure your cells have a chance to like be good, right? Like to be healthy and be good and functioning and get your vitamin K levels up. Giving yourself 30 days, I think would be ideal. Okay. Now, if you are listening to this and you are having surgery tomorrow and you start all this stuff the day after surgery, so that if you're is having still surgery great. tomorrow, basically take, get like 10 eggs out. Okay. <laughs> Just the yolks <laughs> to throw out the whites. You don't need them. Bone broth. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, I think the other part of this is too, is that, you know, the diet that you're recommending, um, it's not for diet, what people consider diet purposes. So if people are not eating well and they start eating healthy, like you're recommending, they may lose weight. We don't want to lose weight. So caloric restriction, which means reducing your calories is not in OT recommended around the time of surgery. You need to increase your calories mm -hmm. because your body will need more calories to heal. Remember, we're talking about controlled damage. That's what surgery is. Yeah, and recovery is hard. I mean, just anybody who's been sick, you know, if you've been sick for a while, like, man, like when you finally start feeling better, like you're usually starving because like your body has basically depleted its stores. It's used up everything it's got and you kind of need to build that back up. When you're recovering, I mean, it's that same thing. You need a lot of that matrix, right? You need a lot of matrix to build, rebuild stuff. Sure. You're, you're building collagen, you're healing perhaps muscle. You know, you're stitching together back skin. You know, this is energy. This is energy demanding for your body. Right. And if you're not giving it what it needs, it, it's it, and it doesn't have anywhere to draw from, and your stores are really low. Like you're gonna have a slow recovery. You're gonna feel fatigue. You're gonna not feel well. It's so interesting. So you see people in the ICU when I went through training, and they would be, be they would be fed through IVs, right? Mm -hmm. So intravenous feedings, uh, and it was amazing how these people would come to life once they, I mean, obviously they were sick and they were had uh, tubes in to help them breathe. But when those tubes came out and they started eating, they, they, they their body changed mm -hmm. and you could see it. So oral feeding of healthy foods was would drastically change these people's conditions. Yeah. And again, they were healing from other things. They weren't as sick, but it was visible yeah. within a couple of days. And that's because it, it it's all a, a dance, right? Like our bodies need a lot of things in the right combination. So supplementing with pre-made food, right? A liquid diet. They're kind of grabbing what the RDA has said is ideal, but that might not be ideal for your type yeah. of tissue. I mean, those, recovery. those things were so specific. The TPN, like, yeah. it's all fat based in this. And but, they're changing know, all the time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's not really a whole source of nutrition. Is it getting you what you need to keep you from dying of a nutrient deficiency? Yeah. Well, I will tell you, it's interesting some of the things you put in here because you go to the ICU now and they are giving some mm -hmm. of these shots. They're giving vitamin D. You'll yep. look on their uh, medication list and these really sick people and they're giving some of these supplements. And that was not the case 15 years ago. Yeah. So, you know, maybe your side of it has started to impregnate the brains of doctors, right, uh, with some good knowledge and that maybe they can take some of this. Now, I don't want to say holistic, right, but the supplemental side, mm -hmm. uh, and then put it over here and see if they can use some of that stuff. Well, and part of that is because there are better ways to um, test for it now. Like I said, you can test serum vitamin D reliably, right? You know, and get a really good return. So that I think the understanding of of where an optimal level is has also improved over time. That's yeah. a good talk. Yeah, I think this is a, a perfect podcast because people, anyone having surgery, you just listen to this and now you have a full description of what you need to do from a supplemental, a supplementation standpoint. Uh, if you have a friend that's going to go through surgery or anyone, just tell them to listen to this, um, you know, whatever it's been, 35, 40 minutes would be the, probably the best 40 minutes they spend before surgery. Again, you have to talk to your physician. So even though Amy's absolutely correct, uh, your physician may not agree with some of these recommendations. Uh, and also, the things we're recommending should not affect your ability to clot, and they should help that. But we don't know what type of surgery you're having. We also don't know what type of medication. So you're I was going to say, if you're on, 
you know, warfarin or Coumadin therapy, obviously you can't take vitamin K. Yeah. So um, please um, talk with your physician, talk with your naturopath or whoever you're working with, uh, and make sure that they're okay with these recommendations. Yeah. But these recommendations are correct and they're awesome. So that's really good. Amy, where is the future going? So this is the last question for you. The future of supplementation? Yeah, because the problem I have with supplements overall is they're not regulated. Correct. And, that, and that's me being a stodgy, not swashbuckling no, uh, I, plastic surgeon. And I 100% so. agree with that. I mean, you see the amount of supplementation that's available and the lack of knowledge around it. I mean, it's it's shocking. I mean, And then the, the perverse incentive financially. Yes, with any field. I mean, I mean especially with supplements like related to sexual dysfunction. Weight loss. Uh, yeah, mood. Yeah. They sell those uh, supplements for breast enlargement. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty, it sucks. It does. And to me, where the future is going is just better education. Better education, also better testing. You know, like I said, even right now, there's no known upper limit for vitamin K intake because there's really no way to test it in a living subject, which is, you know, right. that's nuts. See, I think where it's going to go ultimately is with DNA sequen sequencing uh, that you would be able to go in and take a test and know that maybe you're genetic, genetically predisposed to having lower levels of this and you may be more affected by that. Right, and that exists now. However, do I think that means you need supplementation? No. Um, it's kind of like with MTHFR and other gene SNPs that we've talked about. Like just because you have that, like all genes have a Jekyll and Hyde, there's a negative and a positive to those. So even if you are genetically predisposed to perhaps, you know, um, African-Americans, you know, and they cannot synthesize sun or sunshine as much as Caucasians can. Right, they can't synthesize the vitamin D as much right. as Right, so their conversion can. to vitamin D is very low. Yeah. So that is obviously a known thing. So might they need to supplement? Yes. But if you're genetically predisposed to maybe not be able to extract you know, vitamin C appropriately, like, yeah, then maybe you need to supplement. I think, though, that the scary side of that is that people think that that will fix everything. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, so if you're going to go into surgery, you get a genetic profile that says, one, two, three, four, and five. One of those is you got to do this amount of vitamin C supplementation. That would be really cool, mm -hmm. like to hyper optimize people before they go into surgery. Yeah. So you would have all these supplementations, you would have this whole genetic profile that says this, and you would have all these treatments afterwards to reduce inflammation. I mean, that's like the future. It is. And okay, well, you get on that. So can you right. take care of that for me? Well, but there, I'm going to come back to you. Like, that's all great. But if your diet is not healthy and no, your gut's not functioning. You always go back to this. You know, if you have a, a gut dysbiosis. No, you're right. You're right. It's, it's like, you know, come on. You take all the vitamin C It's simple, C stupid. Want. That's yeah. what you're trying to say. I mean, it's, that really goes down to the basic premise of everything. Mm -hmm. It all comes down to your diet. Properly prepared, nutrient-dense diet. Everyone we talk to, I say the same thing. It all comes down to your diet. And the way you get to a diet that works is dependent on what type of person you are and what you can work with. But I mean, that's really it. And that is absolutely true around the time of surgery. Yeah. And your so, genes play a role in that. Yeah. They absolutely do. So I think, I think you are correct. And I think the Gattaca world of supplementation is probably coming. I don't know that I feel like that's optimal, but I think it's probably coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. You had to listen to me uh, yammer on for a long time about nutrition stuff, but I am happy to answer questions. So please shoot us a DM if you have a question about this episode. Put it in the comment box, and please, on that vein, like, comment, and subscribe. Share us with your friends. It does help us immensely. You can find us at Jason Martin MD on YouTube. On Instagram, we're at Beauty and the Surgeon Podcast, and also at Jason Martin MD. And you can find us on the web at those same as well. Don't tweet us because we don't. And I want to say also, if you're a person out there and you, you're struggling with your nutrition, you're really struggling with your diet, Amy is uh, a certified nutritional therapist and she can uh, help you. Um, she can do that remotely too, can't you? Yep, I you do a lot of my nutrition consults remotely. So feel free to reach yep. out to her, Amy at Jason Martin MD. Uh, last That's thing me. I want to tell you is that we've mentioned some um, topics here today we've talked on previous podcasts. Go back and check our uh, previous podcast out. There's a lot of really good um, episodes back there that talk about plastic surgery, talk about your diet, talk about nutrition, talk about transformation. So I think you'll enjoy it. Thank you. See you later.